truth is hard to swallow. I think I'll chew it. A few years ago, I started writing a fictitious story based on my time as an educator. It is called Taught, and the story was partially inspired out of anger and frustration fueled by burnout. Okay, actually, it was more than partially inspired by anger and frustration. But Taught has also become a vehicle for me to tell what I thought at the time, and in some ways continue to think, was and is the real story of teaching. I now realize that my perspective is not everyone's perspective, but there are some pieces of taught that resonated with many educators. This podcast is an extension of that story, and I, a former teacher, will interview other educators asking them to share how they really feel about the current state of education. Why are so many teachers burn out? Why are so many, like me, leaving the field? We likely won't solve any problems or come up with any solutions, but we can create a community of voices that maybe begin the conversation around how educators can take back teaching. I'm Melissa LaFour. Welcome to Taught, the podcast. I like to be educated, but I'm so frustrated. I think that's really important because even when you and I spoke before, I said, oh, what was it called? And you, you knew it, RTI. Started yep. out as RTI. You know, that was, and that's been some years ago. Um, and then I told you, I worked in a district that was like, oh, no, it's not MTSS anymore. Now it's CIT3. So not only does it get branded poorly, but then we have certain pockets of whatever, whether they're software makers, whether they are, you know, educational resource providers, these companies try to put a new name on some of the pieces. And that kind of makes the, the situation worse, <laughs> to be honest. You're just le- throwing another name that we can't remember. And yeah. Yeah. And I, I also think too, a lot of times the, just the word system in general is kind of a bad word in education. (laughs) Um, you know, the system is broken. The system is this, that is, can all be true, but I genuinely look at a system as a noun and I've never looked at a system as something like I have to do that. That's probably where I got my name, the bulldog really early on, um, was because I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Why are we doing it like that? Because I always look at the people behind it as able to change it and very much created a lot of waves in that way, because I never looked at it as something that was set in stone. And so I do think the word itself, just being in it is really difficult because we think it's something new by changing the name when in reality, we're already doing all this work. We create teachers create systems all of the time for themselves to make their lives sure easier they do. all of the time. And I think that they're really, when I go into a school and I always tell the principals, your teachers are already doing this. We just need to find the ones that are doing it really well and elevate mm-hmm. that thinking. Um, because you're not recreating the wheel here. You're really just trying to find those pockets of excellence that are already happening um, and allowing everyone to benefit from it. And so I'm trying to change, you know, rebranding it into something different. Once again, another theory, rather than just looking at it as something we're already all doing, it's just getting on the same page. I agree with that. And it's a Herculean task. So yeah. <laughs> thank you for taking taking that on. We actually need more bulldogs. My friend Sarah calls them boat rockers. You know, we need some people to rock the boat because we do get complacent. We get frustrated. Those that are burnout are probably quietly quitting. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. I know my last easily three years put me in any in-service I don't care what it was. And I am checking my messages on my phone. I'm not there because I'm, I have already quit. I'm not there, you know? So you're dealing with that. And we, if somebody's going to rock the boat in that scenario, that's going to make me go, huh? That person's like, you know, we need that. We need people to challenge what we're doing and not necessarily make our administration and our higher ups justify what they're doing, but 
But if we're taking that valuable time to come together, we should know our why, which you alluded to in in your work, that you like to get to the why first. How are you feeling about this? And what's our why? I think that's really important. Yeah, I 100% agree. So if I gave you a magic wand and I said, okay, Megan, one thing, you only get one. You can change in education. It's going to improve it for everyone. What would it be? Outside of just streamlining systems, I think the first thing that you have to do is create feedback cycles. Uh, I and love like, feedback. And not just feedback from, the word feedback might even be the wrong word, but I think that kind of going into that idea of listening a survey is not the only level of feedback we should be giving to our teachers. Um, it's really about, and I'll give an example of when I was coaching, I always did two things at the beginning of the year. The first one was aligning on the difference between complaining and venting. I want you to come to me. I want you to vent to me. I want to be a safe space for you to have a hard conversation. Um, and I don't want you to go around to every single person in this whole entire building and talk about the same things. So you have a safe space to talk about that. The second thing that we always aligned on was how you like to give and receive feedback. Because the reality was that the, the situation we were in, we're going to be frustrated at times. This is a hard job. But I want you as your leader for you to be able to come to me and say, this is not working for me. I need help doing X, Y, and Z. And I want to be able to be responsive in a way that you'll be able to hear it. And having that conversation when everyone's already frustrated and you've already developed some type of relationship for a year is the wrong time. You have to do it at the beginning. And I think that if we could have more conversation like that in a more proactive way and that educators knew who they could go to and how they could have, who they could have hard conversations with and that they actually felt heard, then we can improve things a lot faster. Um, because what I've seen particularly recently is we do the survey. We don't like the answers to the survey. So we just do what we were going to do anyway. Yeah. And then that's where you get a lot of frustration is like I said that behavior, everyone in the building said behavior was something we wanted to work on and get support and help with, but we're getting another new curriculum for reading. So I think it's really just about if you're asking for the feedback, being open to it and also knowing being predictable enough that it's creates safety um, and giving feedback like that. So I, I always start with that immediately. And as the first thing that we do is talk about what that looks like in your building um, and how teachers are perceiving it, because most of the time I get to go in and be the third party that listens to everyone. And they're like, but they're not listening. Are you going to make them listen? Um, <laughs> And if, if that, that's a hard situation, you can't create anything unless you have that. Yeah. As you say that I'm thinking, oh my gosh, Megan went to my school because we all said we wanted help with behavior and we got a new reading curriculum and I'm not even joking. I mean, that is exactly what, so I'm guessing this is a common thing that happens yeah. because the district isn't going to pay for the resources to bring in all this stuff around behavior, but they will get on board with a reading program. So administrators have like this hugely tough job, but to your point, know what you can do and how to set up that feedback. I went to a, just a wonderful workshop and it was free. I was very, very blessed. It was a group of people who had worked under Carol Dweck and they did, um, they had all moved up to University of Washington and they had gotten funds to do this program where we could, we could sign up and go. So I went and it was a week long and the whole thing was about mindset, but it was also, they, they really focused on strategies based teaching as well as how to give feedback and how to teach children how to give and receive feedback. And it 
was huge. And I could see a huge difference in my class when I taught them from the beginning of the year, you know, here are sentence stems. This is what we're going to do. We did, ex you know, explicit activities where they got to practice these skills. And I remember going to my administrator saying, we should be doing this with each other because I have a really hard time hearing that I'm doing a crap job, but I have a much easier time hearing, you know what? I really love it when you do this. Oh, here's this activity that you might want to try. You know, that's totally different. I don't hear that as criticism. And I think that oftentimes when we get those little exit tickets are huge right now, right? I mean, everybody wants to do an exit ticket, but there's no parameters around it. So it's, I was bored and this sucked, or I have no idea what you were talking about, or I got it all. I took notes, you know, here's everything you said today, but there's no, I don't know how legitimate and actually not legitimate, how um, meaningful and useful a lot of the feedback that we get actually is. If you're an educator and it's like one thing, if it's, you know, adding fractions, that's pretty easy, easy to use an exit <laughs> ticket for. But if it's those bigger things that oftentimes we're talking about in our professional development, I love your answer. Yes, we need to have meaningful ways to give and get feedback to improve our systems. That's really good. I also want to just highlight that you said around giving, I look at things too, as we talk about giving students skills, like they need this skill to be able to do X, but adults need that too. I, I went into a building and they taught us how they wanted us to give and receive hard feedback. And we actually practice it. And in the moment you kind of find it wonky, but then when you're actually needing to employ it and you know how to have a hard conversation with someone in a way that they can receive it, it allowed me to support my educators and coach them on how to have those conversations and gave me language to practice with them, which then didn't create this weird resentment and tension between them and another, maybe a co-teacher or an administrator they needed to have a hard conversation with, but it allowed us to, to get those, that feedback in a very consistent and timely way because we had a skill that we could use yeah. um, versus yeah. saying, you know what, I don't know how to do it. I'm not doing it. I don't want to be confrontational. We don't actually have to be confrontational because now you have a structure for how to have that conversation. Um, and so really looking at it from a skill perspective for, for adults too. I mean, it's, it's an executive functioning skill for us. And from one bulldog to another, <laughs> it sucks being the person that everybody comes to and says, will you go talk to so-and-so about, and I'm yeah. like, I don't want this role. I don't want the role of being the person that has the hard conversations. You know, it's yeah. exhausting. It's exhausting. Yeah. So if everybody has the skill, then we can all participate in that fun stuff. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and it makes a better culture and environment for all of us. Yes. Yes. Preach it sister. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to switch tax a little bit because this is a question that I ask everybody um, because I think it's a really important piece that's in education right now. I do, I do feel like we're in like this pivotal moment in history as far as education goes. I, something I feel like troubles are brewing. We're going to have to change something in what we're doing. And if we don't, Things are going to happen. They're going to force us to make these changes. Yeah, and one of the things that I come across quite frequently in conversations with educators is the idea of firsthand or secondary trauma that is following them for months and years. And sometimes we just learn to live with it. So we, we are experiencing this either via situations that occur within the schools that we're in, or a lot of times it's just getting close to a student and experiencing that secondarily and really feeling quite helpless from it. So I ask educators to share to their comfort level an experience like this if they've had one, because I think it's important that we kind, kind of hear that we're all 
experiencing it as well as the public at large understands that we're not just sitting behind desks. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting because when you think about the situations that you've been through, for me at least, they were so frequent that I was very desensitized to things that I should have been concerned about. Um, and, and that's something that still to this day, I think a lot about where I'll tell a story and I'm telling it. And then the people I'm saying it to are kind of like, what are you, that's crazy. Like you were in this situation. That's wild. Um, so I, I definitely think it's still something I'm still looking back on my career and thinking about those situations and how they were impactful, um, as a special ed teacher, particularly a case manager, I followed kids from when they entered high school until when they graduated. And so they were with me. I was very much a member of their family by the time that they left school um, and working in title. There was a lot of situations that happened that were externally happening. Um, I would say one particular situation that really changed me as an educator, and, and I eventually needed to get some support with it, um, was a student of mine. He, you know, he was just his own person. He just walked through the life. He wanted to be a paleontologist, just such a cool kid, um, but really struggled with his written and oral communication um, and his reading. And so in high school, if you fail a class, you have to retake a class. So this, you know, he was in multiple English classes at one time and spent pretty much his whole day with me in his 10th grade year. And so he would come to me in the morning time and then he would go to lunch and he would come back after. And we worked on a lot of things and I was a really big advocate for him in the building. And I remember um, getting a phone call that said, you know, the student's coming back there's a medical emergency in the school. We need you to keep him there because it's his brother. Uh, about 20 minutes later, I hadn't seen him. A teacher shows up at my door and she says, I'm pulling you out of class. It's this student that's having the medical emergency. And so I run down to the cafeteria. My boss is standing outside of the door and there's EMS emergency in, in the cafeteria. And he had gone into cardiac arrest during lunch. Um, we ended up, I, I left, went straight to the hospital waiting for, you know, his mom to get there, seeing what was going on. Um, and it was just an underlying condition they didn't know he had. Um, and about three weeks later, he passed away. Um, I think it was one of those situations that really changed me as an educator that I just kind of already went through so much that I didn't necessarily process it or get any support for it and had ended up moving from Virginia to Colorado that year and realized about two years into teaching in Colorado that it was, I was connecting with kids very differently because of that experience and also connecting with teachers differently um, because I had just never dealt with getting that close again, because you're just so it impacted me so greatly. Um, but it was one of those things that I didn't even, I, I really Process. just kind of kept walking. Yeah. I just kept walking and going through the motion and doing because it wasn't like people are calling you and saying, Oh my goodness, this happened to you. How can we help? what's going on. It's just something that you're kind of expected mm -hmm. to keep walking and keep moving and keep showing up after something like that happens. I spoke to another teacher um, who lost a, a colleague, her teaching partner. And she said, I'm not blaming anyone, but the career that we are in has the expectation to do exactly what you just said, to just keep going. And um, I don't think that's very fair to teachers. It takes away our um, humanity in ways at times. You know, we don't get to have those human moments sometimes that it feels like everybody else gets to have because we have to power through. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I think it's too, everyone else is doing the same thing. So it's really hard to be supportive when everyone else around you is also just trying to keep walking and keep moving. Um, and there's no like pause moment for any of it. Yep. Thank you for sharing that. That was tough. Yeah. So I like to, you know, just give you whiplash with the emotions. <laughs> so, uh, but it is important to share those because like I said, we've all got them and we don't talk about them because, because we just don't, right? Yes. We just don't. Um, however, kids can be pretty hilarious. And I also like to hear a good, uh, funny kid story. So what is one of your funniest moments as an educator? Oh, there's so many of them. I, what going back to my early teaching career always just cracks me up because here I was, you know, a 23, 22, 23 year old kid teaching high schoolers. And so they taught me a lot and they also really pranked me. Um, I was, I was lucky that they, they genuinely loved me. So they looked out for me, but man, did they like, twist my arm and do things that they were like, man, we're going to get her really good. Um, we had worked in an old building and I taught, it's called a life skills class. And so we, my room was a literal closet and we had about seven kids in this class and one of the other teachers had experienced a mouse dropping from the ceiling during while she was oh teaching. And I remember telling them, I said, you know what, if that happens to me, I think I might die. Like I, <laughs> I cannot handle this. This is too much for me. I don't know if I can work in this environment. Yeah, that was a mistake. I should never have told them this. Um, we were, they were sitting there, they were supposed to be doing a project and out of nowhere, one of them just screams, pushes the table over, starts yelling that there's a mouse in this tiny room. I'm standing on the desk at this point. <laughs> Absolutely not. Get it up. Get it out. I haven't seen anything. And then they just look at me and are dying laughing, telling me, oh, man, we got you so good. Um, and I, my eyes just turned bright red. <laughs> I cannot believe you did this to me. Um, so they would, that particular group of kids would constantly prank me like that. And I just found it really funny. I mean, it was just kind of like a moment where you just pause and are like, yeah, I'm working with kids and we're just having fun. Um, but they would, they consistently did stuff like that to me for a number of years until they graduated. <laughs> That's a long time. That's yeah. one of those moments when which to me is one of the best as a teacher when you're like, they, I'm one of them, right? They, they accept yeah. me. They like feel comfortable enough to joke around with me yeah, and not in a bad way. Cause when they feel comfortable enough to joke around in bad ways, you're in trouble as we all know well, as teachers. Yeah. They knew I want to play too much. Um, like mm -hmm. if it crossed the line, but they also looked out for me. I remember a few times them being like, miss, we know you're not like that old, like, you know, what's going on. Right. <laughs> um, and so they would always look out for me and, and let me know if I should be more aware of something <laughs> than I was. Um, so it was, it was a good balance between the two for sure. So that kind of leads me into, into the next question, which is, you know, I think that nobody goes into education because we are wanting summers off or to make money neither for what we go through, neither one of them are enough. Um, we do it usually because we believe in the process, right? And I think that all of us have hopefully many, but at least a few of those moments where you're like, this is it. We are in the zone. This is, you know, I call it a glow moment because you're like, it's, it's symbiosis is happening, right? Learning is happening. You're the rock star teacher. Can you tell us about one of those moments from your career? Yeah, I, being a high school teacher, it was really cool because I got to see students graduate. Um, and that's something, I don't know how to describe it. A lot of the kids that I worked with never thought graduation was possible for them. Um, and I have one student in particular, I went to 
the high school I was at and overseeing the program and no one was managing their graduation requirements, which is just crazy to me. So I ended up having to go through like 150 kids and look at all their graduation requirements and make sure they were on track to graduate. And one of the students that I had was not on track to graduate and I would come up with plans for them. So it was kind of like a guidance counselor as well as special ed teacher. But um, I remember I told him, I said, we're going to create a schedule and you will graduate if you listen to me. Like you have to do what I'm telling you to do. And so we created a schedule. We would meet every week and update the schedule. And I remember toward the end of the year, he was stressing me out. I was like, you are stressing me out. This is not getting done. <laughs> and the next week he came in and he goes, I think you just need a chill miss. Like I got this. And I went in and the whole schedule he had done and he had fixed it and it was on track. Um, and he graduated that year as the first generation in his family to graduate from high school. I saw his whole family at graduation with t-shirts with his name on them. Um, congratulations. And when I saw his mom, she just looked at me and he looked at me and they were both just crying and gave me the biggest hug. And even years later, he actually messages me on Facebook, keeps me up to date. And, and one of the things we got him into a transition 18 to 21 program and he was pursuing plumbing. Um, and he just was so incredibly thankful for providing and supporting him to get to that point. Um, but it was, it was one of the most eye-opening, um, pretty heartfelt moments for me personally. I love that story. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. So you have been pretty modest through, through your interview. I'm kind of surprised <laughs> Megan. Uh, be, so I, you know, usually I say, is there anything else you want to share? I'm going to actually tell you what I want you to share. I want you to share what you're doing now. I want you to tell us about your business, what you're doing. I will put links to all of your projects in here so people can, can access that. But I think you're doing some really exciting work. Tell us about that. So through my company aligned, um, aligned that we, I'm actually supporting schools. Kind of my specialty that I have found is going from not having any systems, not really knowing what you're doing to getting started. Um, so I will go into schools. I work with schools through systems reviews, as well as um, what I call my aligned first five and help create and establish the foundational systems you need to actually start the doing the work of creating multi-tiered systems of support. Um, I have worked with hundreds of teachers and school leaders and have found that there are really five stepping stones to getting started and getting started well. And so through my services, through systems reviews, as well as I have online coaching support that's coming out this fall um, that provides not only the informational aspect, but actually teaches you how to create the system with templates and guides already created to get going faster. Um, and so my work is centered around getting started, getting up and running, and then actually utilizing research to create an implementation process. And so for me, I believe that any improvement, any alignment to your system is going to improve teaching and learning. I truly believe that. And my ultimate goal is through that to make the profession fun again. <laughs> so that we can spend the time that we want doing things autonomously to have fun. And so by aligning those systems, really taking some pressure off. So I provide an, a number of services in that way to really partner with people and to hold their hands and, and to guide them through this without starting from scratch, because I really just don't want schools to have to go in and look at the hundred million things the state has put mm -hmm. online to tell them how to do this. Um, really like just taking that learning curve off, off the table and, and just helping you get started immediately, whether that's your school principal that's doing this work, you may be a teacher that's leading this work kind of wherever, whatever level you're at, getting you started and helping you get the right players at the table to, to begin. I, I again, love this. And I think that it kind of aligns with my own philosophy that teachers need to kind of take back teaching. So, um, I feel like what you're, the work you're doing kind of promotes that it promotes 
like you said, teachers being able to bring the fun back into what they're doing, um, aligning things in a way that works for them individually as well as a whole school system. So absolutely. I will be adding all of Megan's contact information in our show notes today for anyone who might be interested in bringing her in, looking at things in a new way, or just maybe changing up the dynamics of what you've got going on in your schools. So Megan, we're going to call this to an end. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we end it? I think the biggest thing is just encouraging people to keep using their voice and find a little bulldog in you, you know, like we all have the ability to impact the system. And if we all feel empowered to be, to do that, then we can create change a lot faster. So I hope people feel a little more empowered by my story in that way. I think they will. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. I'm so glad you're doing this. I wish I knew. Today's episode was produced and edited by me. The theme music is by Otis McDonald featuring Joni Inez. If you know someone who might enjoy these conversations, please share the podcast episodes as much and as often as you can. It's as simple as copying the link you use to access today's episode and sending it in a message or sharing it on social media. I'm a small independent operation and your shares broaden our audience. Perhaps you or someone you know will be inspired to talk about teacher burnout. If you would like to get your voice on my podcast, contact me via the link on my webpage, tot.buzzsprout.com. Coach, speaker, and author Rashid Ogunlaru said, it may take many voices for people to hear the same message. Join me in being one of the many voices rising up to get the message out around educator burnout. This is Melissa LaFour. Thank you for listening to Tot the podcast. I wish I knew.